All right, welcome everyone to Aerospace Live. Now we are honored tonight to not only have one special guest, but two. These two aviation legends of the mountain and backcountry flying. Now, Amy started flying in the early 1980s when she was a geologist and a whitewater river guide. Now, those two experiences cemented her love for the wilderness. Now, she earned her pilot's license back in 1989, continuing on to earn her instrument, commercial, and CFI ratings. Now, in 1992, she got a job flying commercial backcountry air taxi and began teaching the skills required for other pilots to fly safely as well. Now, Amy currently has a BS and a master's in geology and a PhD in education. Now, our second guest host is a recipient of the 1995 USDA Significant Contribution to Aviation Safety Award. He started flying and received his license in 1972. He has his fixed wing turboprop and even jet certifications. Currently has over 18,000 hours, which is amazing, uh, as an instructor, charter, and corporate pilot, and more than 8,000 of those hours have been flying and teaching in the mountains. Now, William was also a DPE for the FAA for over a decade and started one of the very first mountain flying schools in Idaho in 1985. Like Amy, w William also enjoys river rafting, so maybe that's something with the backcountry folks. Amy and Dick have written an important book that every pilot should own. So if you're learning to fly, you're flying, you don't own this book, please go get this book. I'm not saying it just because they're on here. I have ever now read this cover to cover and it's really a great book. I recommend you pick it up and it's this book here, Mountain, Canyon, and Backcountry Flying. I'm gonna throw a link to this book as well as some of the other books that are, um, Dick has written specifically, as well as some of the websites that they're currently running. With that, let's welcome our special guests tonight, Dr. Amy Hoover and RK, Dick Williams. Uh, good evening, Amy and Dick. Hello. All Hello. right, there we go. Hey, Amy, hey, Dick, how are you? Great. Doing well. Great, thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, <laughs> you guys earned every word of it. So so I wanted to start off, um, uh, you know, a lot of our listeners are people that are interested in aviation. Um, and while I definitely want to get into the backcountry side, I always think that the, the, the listeners always are really interested in how people got into aviation. Um, and so if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit, you know, how did you start getting into aviation? You know, how did you kind of form that love? Both of you are super like involved in aviation your entire careers. Um, and you just don't do that unless you really have a love for it. Um, so Dick, if you don't mind, I'm going to let the ladies go first. Um, so, so Amy, how did you get uh, your start in aviation? Well, I, as you said in the introduction, I haven't always been in aviation. In fact, I, I wasn't one of these, you know, kids that was like, I got to start flying when I'm younger. I actually started out in music when I was in high school and college. I, um, was in orchestra and band, et cetera. And it's kind of a funny story it, that led me to Texas Christian university where I did my undergraduate. And I hate standing in line. <laughs> so when I went to to uh, enroll in uh, a science course, I had no idea what geology was. And But the lab instructor was really cute. And he had like this cute South African accent. So I signed up for his class. Six years later, I had a master's degree in geology from Oregon State University. And the reason that leads to the flying is that in the mid-1980s, when I got my master's, there were no jobs, and especially in geology. So that's when... A friend of mine that I graduated with said, hey, I've been river guiding. And so I had already been working in central Idaho since the early 80s doing my master's thesis. So it was kind of a, you know, just a real easy transition to move over to Salmon, Idaho and start river guiding in the same area where I'd been doing geology. And the reason I bring that all up is, you know, I was already, I loved living outdoors. I was doing geology. I was river guiding. And the first time I got a flight in a, quote, little airplane um, was a Britain Norman Islander, a little light twin. And we loaded up and flew into the middle fork of the Salmon River to a strip called Indian Creek. I know how to say Crick because I'm from West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, oh my gosh, this is the most incredible thing. And I was so hooked. It just, my whole life, I said, I just took a left turn. So the geology went one way, the music was over here. I still enjoy them, but I got into the flying kind of through the back door that way. I actually financed all of my flight training by river guiding. And then in the winters, I'd go down to Baja, Mexico, and I was a guide for sea kayaking tours and whale watching. Oh, wow. But then the kind of interesting thing was about a year after I got my pilot's license, I bought a 1947 Cessna 120. 
And I thought, well, I got to build some time. So in the middle of winter, in fact, Dick here let me shove it under the plane, under the wing of his otter. He was flying a twin otter uh, down in Boise, and it was really cold and lots of snow. So he let me bring it in the hangar and shove it under the plane of his, uh, under the wing of his otter. And about middle of January, I took off and flew it all the way down to Florida and finally to Clemson, South Carolina, where I got all my licenses and ratings and things. And then I flew it back. No radio. <laughs> A little antique tail dragger. And it was a really fun trip because everywhere I went, it was so amazing to see this, you know, I'm just some young female with this little antique airplane. And everywhere I went, people were amazing. They'd bring me home and they'd feed me and they'd put <laughs> me up and they'd show me all the great, especially like the World War II veterans that were hanging out at the airport and show me all their airplanes. And I'd stop in at little crop duster strips. And that's a lot of what also drew me to it is that just the incredible people they're in less in general aviation and, and I can't speak as much to the military world. I'm sure they're all great people, but that was kind of my introduction to it. It, it wasn't something I'd planned on. I just kind of fell into it. And then um, being a person who, you know, I've always enjoyed working with people that kind of led to the education side of it. So in the late nineties is when I started that uh, McCall mountain Canyon flying seminars um, over in McCall, which is still running, but I left that um, to go do my PhD at Oregon State. And then now I've been at Central Washington University. Well, I've been teaching college for 25 years, but I've been at Central Washington University now for 18 years. So I maybe that's a little more than you might have needed, but no, that's, that's perfect. That's how I fell into flying kind of uh, through the back door. And Dick here was actually one of my original mentors. When I was, he doesn't even remember. I say, hey, do you remember when you gave me a ride in the otter? He's like, nah, you river guides, y'all look alike anyway. So he, didn't remember, he didn't remember me, but I remembered him. <laughs> so we're going to get back yeah. to community. We're definitely going to talk about community. Um, but I would definitely want to hear from uh, you, Dick, as well. So how did you get started? Sure. Yeah, just going back a little bit of the Twin Otter days. I think that was about 35 years ago, wasn't it, Amy? When 20 was under the wing there. I don't know. I, I call the Twin Otter, which is really my favorite all-time aircraft, probably the ambassador, because I was able to give so many people rides and put them in the right seat and let them fly it. And um, it was a it's the the most perfect backcountry airplane I think ever built. And it was a lot of fun to be able to have that at my fingertips for a few years. I. Uh, I guess I've always kind of been interested in aviation. I remember when I was about 12 years old, I wrote to TWA to find out how to be an airline pilot. Okay. And uh, when I went to college, I considered ROTC, but my eyes weren't good enough to fly uh, fighters. And so um, I put that aside. Uh, I got my first airplane ride from a cousin when I was 15 in the back of a Satabria on a ranch in Wyoming. He was checking his horses and his cattle and and I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, when I got out of college, I had a motorcycle, an old Triumph motorcycle, and I really wanted to learn to fly. And I sold that motorcycle for $800. This was in 1972. And that's what it cost to get a private license in California. The uh, 150 Cessna went for $10 an hour, wow. and the instructor was $6 an hour. And I got a license with about 42 hours. So it came out about even. Worked pretty well way back in the day. Um, then I went to the ocean and I went sailing for almost a year, which was uh, the first book I wrote, Aged in Saltwater. And uh, I still like flying because even though I was broke and in New Zealand, I, I remember renting a Cherokee 180 or 140 for, for an hour so I could stay somewhat current. Um, I came back to the States and... Um, I had about 50 hours probably total time and rented an airplane and flew over the mountains of central Idaho and immediately just uh, fell in love with it. I just got entranced with it. I remember looking at a, a little postage stamp airstrip at the bottom of uh, bottom of a canyon. It was flying B, Amy, and couldn't believe that that was an airstrip and the people could land on places like that and immediately decided that's what I wanted to do. So, so when you, so how did, I know that Amy, you mentioned that, um, um, you had first met Dick and he had helped you out. So, but it seems like that was at the very beginning of your career. Um, how did you guys get back together, uh, to work on this book? <laughs> 
I was laughing because <laughs> it was actually reluctant at first. I'll just spill that one. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I guess, as I mentioned, I had uh, three of us started that McCall seminars back in the 90s. And then, unfortunately, our senior partner um, died soon after. But I had already, you know, written some things, um, training manuals and the materials that we were using. And I'd also been teaching a college course in mountain and canyon flying and doing a lot of presentations and and other things. And I'd written some articles in magazines. And, you know, that went on for almost 20 years. And I thought, you know, it's time to just to write a book. And there was already there were a lot of books out there already. In fact, you've read our books, so you know that we mm -hmm. certainly pay um, give credit to all the other authors and and use their works in our book. Because certainly Dick and I don't know any much of well, we don't know everything for sure. But anyway, I thought, well, I'll, I'm going to write a book. So I applied for a sabbatical from the university, which basically means you take a year away from teaching to focus on something. So I I actually proposed this book to ASA with an, uh, an application and they approved it. So I had a contract and then that's when I approached Dick. Um, you know, we had been in touch off and on over the years. Um, he had given check rides to my students when I was down in Boise. And um, the reason I chose Dick, of, or, you know, all the people that were out there, first of all, I, I read his other works and knew that he, uh, he's a great storyteller and he certainly knows his stuff. And he had also started one of the first mountain flying schools and, also um, had a video out that I even used in my classes, but quite honestly, I've always admired Dick and I've always, you know, looked up to him as, as sort of an icon in this um, backcountry flying. And so that's why I approached him. And like I said, he was a little bit reluctant at first. He said, well, I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, when I showed him what I had already done, I think he decided that it was well worth it. And I'm so glad that it, that it did work out because to me, everything, should be better with collaboration if you're mm. collaborating with the right person. And both of us approached it with the idea that we don't know everything, but we can go out and find other resources, other authors. As you know, we have a lot of guest authors in the book mm -hmm. and um, added those people's voices. And then one of the really neat things was the stories because this book, it, it's a technical book, but it also has stories in context. And Dick knew some people that I didn't know, and I knew people that he didn't know. And so it worked out really well, I think, that way. So, Dick, yeah. what caused you to want to start that school? Um, accidents. You know, um, I started flying commercially in the 70s, and, and there were some pretty bad uh, fatal accidents. The, the safety record was not good in the backcountry. Uh, and... Um, I lost a lot of friends, people I knew, and I thought there had to be a better way. You know, there had to be some, some teaching, some basics going on. And that's why I was happy to team up with Amy. She's a great writer, a great professional, and I'm not the best at textbook type writing. We found our rhythm after two or three months and we worked on it. I don't know, two years, I think, Amy, quite a while, but, uh, we, we formed a good partnership, I think, and we come at it from a couple of different directions where Amy is a college professor and works with the younger people. I was interested in bringing um, this textbook to people like me who never got trained really professionally, not in a university setting or college setting, um, old timers, you know, that could come back and look at stuff maybe they never really totally understood or they've forgotten or put aside. So um, I kind of come at it from the old person's perspective and Amy from the young, and I think that's a good combination too. And like Amy said, the, the guest authors, the people that we, uh, we noted and brought in uh, makes it really made the book, I think. Yeah. You know, um, you know, we mentioned community earlier, so that's actually a good segue to, to talk about that. So you know, I, I'm always impressed with all the folks that I get a chance to talk to. Um, you know, aviation is a, is, it's a small world. I mean, it really is. Um, you know, and if somebody really invests themselves into, you know, has a passion for aviation, they, they, they can really make a big change for so many people. Um, so Amy, on, on your side, now you, you are, are you still uh, teaching flying? I do. At the university, um, I'm mostly teaching in the classroom, but I also do what are called the stage exams. So the flight checks for people 
you know, the students when they come to the stages. But then I also have a small business called Canyon Flying that I run in the summers. I'm always back over in Idaho in the summers. I have don't think I missed one in 35 years. I, I don't live there permanently anymore, but I do uh, backcountry instruction. The the client brings their aircraft. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a an airplane, but I don't use it for instruction. Um, actually, I have it on floats right now, so I wouldn't do a backcountry anyway. <laughs> um, but uh, the client brings their airplane, and we spend two, three, four days um, out in the mornings flying, and then in the afternoons we might do some ground school and stuff. So yeah, I I probably log 150 hours of flight instruction a year still, and then I fly on my own as well. All right. So if I bring a 182, you help me help teach me. Absolutely. All right. Um, <laughs> I may put a, I may put a GoPro inside the inside the cockpit um, uh, if you're okay with that. But um, I, I I think that'd be really great. Um, you know, now since both of you have you know obviously such incredible um, backgrounds and knowledge in um, in backcountry flying, for somebody that's just starting to learn to fly, right? They're 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 in their first say 10 hours or so. Um, what do you, th- you're both really great instructors. So what do you think is really important for that, that new pilot for them to try to really focus on? I guess, uh, Dick, why don't you, if you want to, you can go first. I think Amy could answer that better, but, uh, yeah. I, I think you have to have some real enthusiasm for it. I, I know a lot of people approach it probably with a little bit of apprehension, you know, what it's going to be like to solo. What, what is it going to be like to be out there by myself? Um, if I'm interested in it as a career, is that possible? Mm-hmm. You know, is there a pilot shortage? You know, that kind of thing. Um, I think enthusiasm, the ability to listen to the instructor and to um, have a relationship with the instructor. If it's not the right instructor, if it's not working, try someone else because I think that's, really critical to have an instructor that you understand and get along with and respect. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm actually still friends with my instructor from, you know, 20 plus years ago now. Um, Amy, what, what do you think is the, one of the most important things? Well, I think too, it, it's about being honest with yourself. I mean, every pilot secretly knows that they're like the total top gun, best, the best, the best. <laughs> <That's right. right? laughs> until, until that one time they realize they're not. <laughs> Just being honest with oneself about, you know, what are my capabilities? How can I work on this? And setting your own personal limits and not letting, you know, outside influences um, kind of overtake that. Like whether you think, well, I'm not good enough or I don't have the ability or the opposite of that is, you know, I'm the best, the best and uh, I know everything. So just be honest with yourself. And like Dick said, have enthusiasm. And there's a funny little story I I remember from um, when I was doing my primary flight training back in Salmon, Idaho. Um, you know, I'd go up in the little 150 with my instructor and we'd do a maneuver and we'd do this, we'd do that. And so anyway, it came a long time for my check ride and I had never heard of the practical test standards at the time. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know what they were. And I found a copy and I told my instructor, I brought it in. I said, wait a minute. It says here that I can be a hundred feet off my altitude and I can be 10 degrees off my heading. How come you didn't tell me that? He said, well, because that's not the way we do it. We right. hold a heading and we hold an altitude. And we hold an airspeed. So he he purposely didn't even tell me that I could have, you know, wiggle room. And I think there's a really important lesson in that because we just, you know, we set a standard and we trained to that standard and that was it. Um, Didn't kick ourselves for not, you know, doing something or, you know, I give checks, uh, check flights to students who they think, oh, it's okay because I was only a hundred feet off and, Mm -hmm. you know, fine. But that's, you know, it's just an attitude of let's strive for perfection or strive to hit the bar and then, you know, be the best you can be. And I think there's some personal satisfaction in that for people too. So again, it's about one's, one's attitude of just do the best you can. Don't beat yourself up. As Dick said, you know, have a good relationship. And most of all, just have fun, mm-hmm. <laughs> have fun with it. That seems like something you, that's a lot like, you know, you see a lot of pilots to get their pilot's license and they're so excited. They go, you know, they get their pilot's license and then they kind of get into the routine, right? They don't really have a reason for flying. Um, you know, their wife or their husband doesn't want to fly with them every time they go flying. Um, so, you know, they start just flying, you know, to, from point A to point B to point C with, you know, just kind of normal training, but they're not really trying anything hard. Um, but that country seems like just, it just opens the doors, you know? I mean, like, it's just a different 
it's just a different feeling probably when you're flying in the mountains. Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's what did it for me when I saw those mountains. That was that was what really clicked for me. Uh, I taught my son to fly, and he now flies F-22s in the Air Force Reserve. And uh, for him, he always had that goal. Mm -hmm. um, I did not push him into flying. He was looking up in the sky when he was two years old every time an airplane went by. And um, so he had the enthusiasm built in. But he also had the drive that this is what he wanted to do. He wanted to go in the Air Force and he wanted to fly fighters. And he had that goal and stuck to it. And whatever that goal is, if it's backcountry or military or airline, if you have your eye on that objective, you know, and uh, you keep that uh, and you keep your focus, that's that's important. Now with, now, with both of you having, you know, taught for so long for, for backcountry flying, um, and, and Dick, you specifically, you, you, you mentioned that um, uh, the re one of the reasons you started the school was for safety. Um, you know, there was just so many accidents um, that folks were losing their lives. So with all the experience that, that you have, um, and Amy, I'll come to you second with the same question, but for Dick, when you started that, what what was like kind of like the, uh, I don't want to say the aha moment, maybe that's not the right way of saying it, but you know, what was like the main thing that you saw people doing that you were like, okay, this is something that in general people need to get better at. And, and you know, just maybe a couple of things that you were finding that if pilots really focused on a couple of things, it would really improve their safety. Back then, um, navigation was a, a bigger thing. We didn't have Loran even, you know, not to mention GPS. VORs and ADFs didn't work back in the remote areas, so it, you had to know where you were. And a lot of the accidents were pilots being at an air, the wrong airstrip. Uh, and that's gone now, pretty much, with GPS. You pretty much know where you are. Um, it's still really easy to get in trouble with weather. Uh, in, in central Idaho, in Alaska, in a lot of areas, Alaska, they're so big and the weather moves so quickly and lots of different weather systems. Um, if you're not careful with weather and watching it and keeping an escape path, that can get you hammered. Or you just are trying too much scud running and you get disoriented, don't know where you are. Those are primary. Um, another thing is just basic aircraft control which is really what mountain flying comes down to is a more exacting demand of your private pilot skills, airspeed and altitude control. Um, so you know how to come in, you have an aim point, you know how to work an aim point, you're on airspeed, you're on altitude, you don't overrun, uh, you know, and land long. Um, I see that as a bigger problem than landing short generally although they could both happen. Um, planning ahead to know if you can go around or at what point you have to decide whether you're going to go around or not. Um, just some of those, you know, it's what you learn as a private pilot, but it's bringing it down to maybe a little tighter standard. But Amy, before I come to you, I want to follow up with that, that a little bit. So um, Dick, do you feel, cause we do have, you know, Garmin and Foreflight and, you know, every, you know, you can, you know, where you are on the earth to, you know, the, the millimeter, it seems like, right. Um, do you feel that that actually can be a detriment in some ways to the pilotage skills, um, as far as, you know, pulling out a map and figuring out which, you know, canyons you can go in at which altitude and you kind of get complacent by thinking, you know, you've got this piece of glass and it's going to get you out of trouble. But meanwhile, you, you put yourself into a Canyon that doesn't have a way out um, for you that uh, do you think that, that that's a current issue that we might be getting ourselves more into? Absolutely. And we have some good examples of that in the book. Um, accident, we have uh, a lot of accident examples that we, we uh, relate to that chapter that we're talking about. And I can think of a couple examples we used in the book that were directly related to try to find a straight line and a GPS. Well, when you're flying a big mass of mountains, I think um, pilotage and dead reckoning are 
still very, very important. One of the first things we teach is how do you tell downstream from upstream? You know, if you're going downstream, you're going to lowering terrain. Right. It's generally a pretty good thing. If you're going upstream, you better be really sure where you are because um, that can turn into a blind canyon. Or if you turn up a canyon that's almost as big as the one you were going downstream, all of a sudden you're going upstream and the weather's kind of bad or you're not paying attention, you can be getting yourself in a bind in a hurry. So absolutely, um, yeah, dead reckoning and pilot is just a, just a basic that you can't live without. I had a friend of mine that um, he flew, you know, I don't know if you ever heard of the Cannonball Run which, with the cars, um, yeah. you know, they go from New York to LA as fast as they can. Uh, of course, never breaking the speed limit. Um, uh, there's also, there's an aviation version of that, right? Um, that takes off of, um, takes out of usually LaGuardia or, or one of the local local ones if they're flying smaller airplanes. And they'll try to get to LA as fast as possible or smaller strip off side of LA. And a friend of mine flew that one year, and which is it's, it's crazy. Um, but he said he actually almost got, it, it almost ended for him because he got him, when he got to the mountains outside of uh, California, um, he got himself in some bad trouble because he got icing up high and pushed him down so he couldn't overfly the mountains like he thought he was going to be able to. Um, but he said what you mentioned there about the stream, he said that's what saved him. Um, he found a stream and he followed the stream out because um, he had no clue where he was. So he just followed the stream. Um, so Amy, how about you? What have you seen? What um, what have you seen? Well, and of course, um, all of the things that Dick said are totally relevant. I find some of the things I end up working with people on are um, decision making. Yeah, you, you get your pilot's license and you know, there's that little song, you can always go around, you know, <laughs> and as Dick mentioned, no, you can't. <laughs> and so you really, you have to start planning way ahead in your pre-flight when you're um, looking at, you know, quite honestly, Google Earth is actually a really good tool, I think, because mm -hmm. you can go and you look at the terrain, look at the charts, uh, figure out how am I going to get there? How am I going to use that pilot and dead reckoning? Once I get there, what am I going to do? You know, you don't just want to blindly approach the whole situation without planning. One of the things Dick and I have talked about a lot that we see more than um, more than we used to probably in the last several years, uh, at least in the Idaho backcountry, is people that have never been there will follow someone else, like two or three or four or even 10 airplanes in a row. Oh. And one will fly in and land somewhere and the rest of them will all follow them. They And they don't know anything about it. They don't know anything about the strip. They're just following someone. And there's a lot of accidents that have happened from that. And so, you know, when I fly with people, I tell them my objective is to, to by the time we're done, is that they don't need me anymore. Because <laughs> right. I'm not going to tell them, do this, do that. I'm going to say, hey, you know, I use a lot of questions. What about this? What do you think of this? The terrain, the weather, the, the actual performance of the airplane. Is the airplane capable? Are you capable? Do you know when to say no? Uh, years ago, when I was in Salmon, I remember I was working at our friend Lenny Skunberg, who's in our book. He's the, um, the uh, Maintenance Technician of the Year Award back in the 80s, an amazing, brilliant mechanic who has done backcountry maintenance uh airplane maintenance for decades, but I was working for him at one point and I remember um, a hunter or somebody came in and they hired one of the air taxis to take them into a little airstrip in the Middle Fork Canyon uh, called Simplot is what it was called at the time. So they loaded up and left and about an hour later they came back and the hunter, he was really upset because he said, you know, this pilot doesn't know what he's doing. We circled and circled and then he came back and he wouldn't land. Mm -hmm. So he walked across the strip to the other uh, flight operation, the other air taxi and hired them. About an hour later, they come back, and he was really mad. He said, what's <laughs> wrong with these pilots? They what, Were they afraid? They, and I said, dude, he, they probably saved your life. Yeah, right. Because what they, was, it. they went in, they looked at the conditions of the strip, and they said, no way. Mm -hmm. And they came home. And I think that's a really important point to make because there's a lot of times where you need to take the time, assess the situation, look at the wind and the weather and the terrain and your possible – you know, approaches and departures and, and possibilities for go arounds and your own, how you feel in that day. Are you on your game? Dick wasn't kidding when he said precise aircraft control. You on a short strip with a heavy airplane, one or two knots of airspeed on final can make a big difference in whether you overrun or, or run off the end or crash for the beginning. And so, you know, how are you doing that day? 
if you're not quite on your game, maybe you better just go somewhere else. <laughs> and that's hard right. for the general aviation pilot who's used to flying on an 8,000 foot long, 150 foot wide, you know, class C airport all the time. You know, you put them, this, Amy, this is one of my fears, right? So I come out with you, <laughs> you know, one of the summers and, and you helped me out. And I, you know, I'm a guy who's used to, you know, um, our, one of our airstrips here, our, it's an Air Force airstrip. And um, it's got a 10,100, you know, foot long runway. So you're going to say, hey, Bob, go land on this thousand foot long runway. <laughs> and I'm going to be like, how do you do that? <laughs> um, well, that's what we do is how do you do that? I mean, uh, uh, actually, quite honestly, people say, what can I do to prepare? One of the best things I think is an instrument rating mm -hmm. um, because it, you, you're more precise. You learn how to better aircraft control. Another one is a glider, glider time. Um, that little Cessna 120 I mentioned, it's a tiny little airplane, 85 horsepower, 90 horsepower actually I had in it. I flew it all over the Idaho backcountry. And that's where I learned about wind mm -hmm. and riding lift and using lift and staying out of the downdrafts and staying out of trouble because I, I didn't have that option. I had this little motor glider basically. Um, so it's you know decision-making being really, that's when I was getting to earlier too about be honest. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have, I don't know, I don't have anything to prove. Um, hope that's not an attitude that I would have. It's like if, if three people landed and they say, Oh, come on in, it's fine. And it doesn't look right to me. Mm -hmm. I have to go by my own personal, you know, gut feeling if for, to, for lack of a better word, just, is this going to work for me today? If not, I don't have a problem just saying, no, I'll, I'll go somewhere else today. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't, yeah. The get their itis issue is even more, more of an issue. Um, so Amy, next question, I'm gonna start with you and then, and then Dick, I'll come over to you. Um, so let's say you've got a general aviation person, right? And they're flying in a relatively flat area. Um, like I'm here in Greenville, South Carolina, which is right next door to where you did a lot of your initial flight training. Um, I fly all the time to those, uh, those airports. So that's fun to hear that you started there. Um, so what would be the benefit to somebody saying, you know, they're flying flat country, basically. What would, other than just saying I'm, I'd enjoy trying something new, from a pilotage standpoint, what would be the real benefit to somebody saying, you know what, let me go spend a week out, you know, in, in, in one of the schools that teaches backcountry? Like, what would be their benefit when they came back? Well, I think overall, it a lot of it, again, we focus on, as Dick mentioned, basic aircraft control. Um, you know, if somebody comes to fly with me, maybe they already know. what I say, what power setting do you use to get to your maneuvering speed? Or that's an important one, because if you get turbulence, which you could, you need to know what to slow down to. And if you're down in a canyon with not a lot of room to maneuver, you don't need to have your head down hunting right. for power settings. Um, so, for example, you know, what do you have to reduce your speed and power to to get to your flap setting? And how do you know if your airplane can turn around in a small enough radius? And if not, what do you need to do to set it up that way? And so a lot of it really comes back to basic pilot or excuse me, just uh, not pilotage in the tense of navigation, but pilotage is flying your airplane, you know, basic aircraft. And actually, both in chapter one of our book and then later in chapters five and six, we talk about, you know, Dick um, is the one I saw that had done this first when I was first learning because I learned to fly in salmon right when Dick was leaving salmon. So we kind of overlapped a little bit, but they call it running the numbers. And, you know, you probably do this in your training. It's like, hey, I've got an airplane, but I've put a stole kit on it or or maybe it's just a stock airplane um, and it's, I want to load it to a certain center of gravity or a certain weight. And then what's the stall speed? What does it behave like? What power setting do I need to fly at this speed, at this weight and this center of gravity at this density altitude? And so a lot of that, you don't have to be in the mountains to do that. You could go right up above South Carolina there and mm -hmm. go up to eight or 10,000 feet and just figure it out um, and become, don't accept, that goes back to that story I told er earlier, don't accept any um, wiggle room, be precise. If you want to fly the approach at 62 knots, then you fly it at 62 knots, not 60, not 64, because there's a lot of uh, precision. You know, the better you can become at being precise at what you want to do, the more that aircraft's going to do exactly what you want it to do. Yeah. I that's like, quite I, your question. Yeah, no, that was perfect. You know, and actually, um, you know, it's, it's understanding the power settings, right? I mean, the airplane, depending on, we you know what the air is, right? I mean, the airplane's going to operate, you know, the same every time. So if, if you have that precision and then, and you learn that precision and you're not just fluffing it all the time, um, the airplane will perform exactly as you ask it to. Um, 
Dick, how about you? What do you think? What would be the benefits? Like, you know, somebody that they're not going to move out to the country with the mountains and, um, but you know, what's the benefit for them to come out and get some of that training? Yeah. Before I get into that, just back up, um, to, to what Amy was saying. And, uh, of course we all know the caveat to that aircraft precision is the wind and the air. And, uh, Amy, basically did the chapter on meteorology in this book and made it very, very interesting. And the reason the weather gets so critical to critical flying is you can't maintain that precision. You can't maintain that airspeed and altitude control when you're getting bumped around and you've got wind. And that's why we just, that changes the whole dynamic of mountain flying. And that's where meteorology really comes into being important. And the pilots that Amy was talking about that turned around from Simplot um, probably did because of wind. And they knew they could not fly that accurately in those conditions. And so they couldn't get in there safely. Mm -hmm. But to go back to, to your question about how does this apply to everyone to who's flying, um, a guy named Rod Machado did our uh, introduction, and um, the older your older listeners, I'm sure, will know who Rod is. Um, mm -hmm. Very well known in aviation, not only a humorist but uh, an extremely professional, competent instructor and pilot. And um, both Amy and I had worked with him a little bit. Amy knew him better than I did, um, but uh, he agreed to read our book and um, did a a two page. Uh, introduction forward that uh, just astounded us. And I think one of the statements that he made in that was, unless you live in Florida, unless you fly in Florida, you need this book. Because Florida is the only state <laughs> that has no hills. So um, I think his point was, no, no matter where you're flying, this stuff is important to, to a pilot. And um, I can't say it better than Rod did. Yeah, so you're saying Disney World Space Mountain? That doesn't, uh, you don't have to have precision to fly around Space Mountain? Rod doesn't think so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that's all right. We'll, we'll forgive him. So um, now, if somebody was looking forward to flying, you know, Amy, you had mentioned that, you know, a lot of your clients are bringing out their own airplanes. Um, this is such a loaded question, and I can't wait to see the politics from uh, the forums. Um, you know, lighting this up, but, um, what do you guys think is like, you know, say like a four seater sized airplane or a two seater sized airplane if it's a cub, but what would you say is like a really great beginning, uh, back country pilot airplane? Well, it really depends on your mission, right? Um, let's say you want to take the family, the kids, the dog, load them up, go camping. Well, in a super cub, you're going to have to make five trips, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, Cessna 182, in my opinion, is a great backcountry airplane for that kind of purpose, or even a 206, which, but now you're getting a little more cost for most people. Um, if you want to just go fly really slow and, and, you know, get into the really short strips, um, then, you know, Dick has a super cub. I have a scout. They're both two seat tandem tail draggers that with the big fat balloon tires on them. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, like I said, it, you're probably going to have all kinds of people on your forum there, but um, it, it really does depend on your mission. The backcountry air taxi services, they're hauling big loads. They're flying the Britain Norman Islanders. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually a Kodiak out there. There's a caravan. The Otter, as Dick mentions, a great airplane. The singles, they mostly stick with the Turbo 206 Cessnas. Um, so there's not really a, you know, a, a bad airplane. I would, would kind of um, bracket that by saying, you know, it depends on how rough the strips are as well. If you take a low wing airplane, like a Piper or a Mooney or some, uh, you know, any of those, the prop is closer to the ground, the wings are closer to the ground. So there is a chance that you're going to have potential for more damage um, on a low wing aircraft. I prefer a high wing tail dragger just because I got more prop clearance. I can turn around in a kind of a shorter turn radius on the ground. Um, and that's mostly what I've had. So, Dick, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> I agree with you. 182 is really hard to beat. But to your earlier point, um, what you learned with your 120 yes. is similar to what 
I started flying the backcountry in, which was an 85 horse champ. And I think there's a tremendous amount of value to learning to fly the wing instead of the engine. And those little underpowered airplanes can do that if you have a good instructor and if you realize and understand its limitations. Um, because the bottom line is there's nothing like horsepower. Uh, you know, um, especially when you're old, and your reflexes aren't as fast as they used to. Be. Like my, I like my, I like my horsepower now. <laughs> but I think it was a tremendous aid to my learning to have to understand downdrafts and updrafts, as Amy was saying with her 120. And a lot of people set a minimum and say, I won't go into the backcountry or, or high density altitude or whatever without a, th these minimums. And uh, I understand that, but you can do, if you understand the limits, you can do a lot with uh, a slower, underpowered airplane. You have to be more careful, and you're going to have more limitations for sure on the time of days that you can fly and so forth. But uh, there's, not a, there's not much of a limit to get back and enjoy at least part of the backcountry or the mountains, I so, think. So, Amy, the... Um you had mentioned the glider, right? So in Civil Air Patrol, we actually offer to our cadets a glider academy. So they can actually sign up and then go to glider academy. Unfortunately, it was closed because of COVID this year, but uh, hopefully we'll be back. That'll be back in shape this next year. And you do hear overall, like if you look at the, the kids that learn power first, um, and then you look at the kids that, you know, because they can start earlier, uh, younger and glider. So, you know, the kids that had glider experience before they went to that power, you can just see the difference in pilotage, you know, and just their, their ability to kind of have the feel for what, like you said, Dick, what that wing is doing, um, as opposed to, you know, the, uh, the kids that are only have only flown power aircraft and they're used to just saying, okay, if I have to go there, I, I need to give it more gas. Um, and so, you know, as opposed to really thinking about what the, the air is doing. And, um, so I think that's really good. So, um, now Amy, question for you. So, the, so actually, this is maybe for both of you, but probably one of you can answer it. So, if somebody's got a 182, I, I personally, anybody who watches the show knows 182 is my favorite general aviation airplane of all time. It's got a great, it's, it, it's got a little bit more room. You guys haven't met me. I'm six foot eight, about 290 pounds. So, a, a 150, I flew one time and I was able to turn it just by leaning from one side to the other like a motorcycle. Um, but, um, you know, I know 172 is a little cramped, but uh, 182 is nice and roomy um, if you don't. You know, one thing I will say, um, I took this directly from your book when I was reading this last week, and, and I never really thought about this before. I've always had the opinion of you put every drop of gas in that you can put into the wing. Um, and I think you guys mentioned, correct me if I'm, if I'm saying this wrong, I think you guys mentioned you said something like 50% beyond, you know, so to forget the 30 minute thing. If you're flying backcountry, um, you want to do about 50% your total distance or your total time in the air. Um, that's your better reserve number. Um, but I actually thought about that and, um, I was like, you know, I, I've got 80 gallons, 80 plus gallons in the wing. I, I don't, I'm flying for an hour. <laughs> you know, I could, I could probably have a lot better performance, you know, if I was going to go into the mountains. Um, I never even thought about that. Like in my mind, I always thought, if I have 88 gallons, I want every drop because if I get into trouble, I want to be able to divert someplace far away. But where am I going to divert that's six hours away? You know, <laughs> um, I mean, I got seven hours if I lean the engine out. Um, so I, I will say that that part of your book specifically, I really had to stop and think about. Um, so you're talking about, you know, working the numbers. Um, so uh, one question I did have on the 182, Amy, so you brought it up, is... Um, is if you've got a 182, and both of you guys, I always call them marshmallow tires. Is that what? Is that like the unofficial term for those? <laughs> I haven't really heard that one, no. No? <laughs> um, Ryan, Ryan Farron, who is a, a Quest Kodiak pilot in Papua New Guinea, flies missions, um, you know, to the little grass airstrips in the middle of the mountains. He, um, he, he, he calls them marshmallow tires, but because uh, you land on them, you feel like you're landing on a marshmallow. Um, but uh, do you recommend that? Like, so if somebody's going to bring their own airplane and they just have the standard tire, do you recommend that they they swap the tire out to something not really crazy big, but something a little bit, you know, bigger um, before they come out to you? Not necessarily. I mean, I when people come to fly with me, I'm helping them fly what they have. Mm -hmm. You know, I do recommend to take the wheel fairings off. 
because you can get debris and rocks and stuff and you can actually crash your airplane because stuff gets stuck up in there. But I, I've got a lot of time in 182s, for example, on normal gear and normal wheels and normal tires, normal nose strut. Uh, you just fly what you have. Basically, now, again, in our book, we show some examples of some different conversions, for example, on a 182, where you can put bigger tires, bigger wheels, bigger, beefier nose strut. And, you know, if somebody's going to be doing a lot of operating on rough surfaces, maybe that's worth it. Th that person would then have to decide, is it worth spending all that money when I'm only going to do it once or twice? Right. Or would it be better off spending it on more safety gear, more training, you know, fuel, et cetera? That, that's really kind of a personal decision. Um all the backcountry air taxi operators operate it for years, and they still do with standard equipment on their Cessnas. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, I even mentioned earlier a low-wing airplane is just susceptible to more damage. It doesn't mean that it's bad. I mean, I've I've gone into all, a lot of these backcountry strips in all kind of low-wing airplanes. Um, so it's I think it, what it comes down to is again, what's your mission? Fly what you have. Learn to fly what you have better, or at least be the best you can at it, and make those good decisions. There's there's one strip um, that's super rough. We have pictures of it in our book. <laughs> it's it's like three different strips tiered on top of each other, and oh. it's really rough. And it it goes uphill and sideways and curves. And people say, "Hey, will you take me in there?" I'm like, "Yeah, let's go in your airplane." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's just everybody that goes in there. I mean, I take my plane in there, but, um, you know, not on a routine basis because it's so rough that even if you do everything right, there's a chance that you're just going to ding a landing gear or a prop or a tail wheel or a nose wheel or whatever. There's just, there's just more chance of it. So, you know, to get back to that again, I, I agree 182. In fact, I've done some mountain flying training for the Civil Air Patrol in Oregon for the Oregon wing uh, a few years ago. And that's what they fly. They have Cessna 182s um, and they have a whole mountain flying training course. It's been going on for God, 10 or 15 years, I guess. And I've done some of their training with them and, and it's a, a great airplane. So it, you know, yeah, if you've got several hundred thousand dollars, go out and buy one of these brand new Bush planes and with all the fancy stuff. But mm -hmm. if not, just figure out how the equipment that you currently have can do the mission that you want it to in the safest way possible that makes sense. And that's where the pilot comes in and in the decisions you're making. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you guys think about, um, you know, Dick, cause you mentioned, you know, uh, safety was really kind of the reason why you started teaching. Um, you know, now we have something that, you know, Cirrus started with, but now any of the airplanes, you can retrofit just about anything. And that's the, the parachutes. Um, do, do you find that, that, what do you think about those? Do you think that that's something that can really help? I mean, or do you think that that people might use it as a crutch and not, really try to work themselves out of the situation? I've only flown one airplane with a parachute. Uh, it's an ex it was an experimental thing. I had no training in the parachute. Uh, I was delivering it for a new owner. Um, hadn't been trained on it. Didn't know the last time it had been packed. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't know anything about it. And the person I bought it that this that I was picking it up from um, said, well, make sure you pull that pin so your your arm to pull that parachute if you need to. And I said, nah, nah, you know, I don't think I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. um, it's right there. Uh, if I need to pull the pin and pull the parachute, I know where it is, and I looked at it, and I know how to do it. But I don't plan on doing it unless I have a midair or uh, – you know, not even if I'm, on, if I'm on fire, because if I'm on fire, I'm going to dive bomb. You're going to burn the parachute. I can. <laughs> so there wouldn't be a lot of instances that I, where I personally would plan on using it. Um, and that's the only airplane I've even been in that had one. So I'm probably not really qualified to talk about that, Bob. Uh, you know, I, I, I know, um, the vice president of Cirrus, and he's a friend of mine, mm -hmm. and um, he would be a good one to answer for. I know they believe in them, mm -hmm. and they have saved people. Um, I don't know enough about those accidents to know what happened and what prompted them, but uh, they have saved lives. There's no question. Yeah, I know Cirrus has. Uh, they've they've really have worked hard on their education of the pilots that are buying those airplanes, especially the second hand. You know, people that are not buying them firsthand. You know, they're the second and third owners um, because a lot of pilots, it seems like from the accident reports that we review here, that uh, 
those pilots that have those, they will put themselves into a more dangerous situation uh, because they feel that they have that as a safety net. Um, and Cirrus is like, you know, listen, you may walk away, but you, it may be a very slow limp and the airplane will never fly again. Um, yep. You know, so don't put yourself into an icing situation, you know, thinking that, well, you know, if bad comes out, you know, you've got this parachute. Because Cirrus actually, um, their actual fatality rates were not very good when the, the parachutes first came out. Um, and now with the, I mean, they were almost triple, I think it was. And I apologize to anybody who's serious <laughs> listening to this. You can correct me if you'd like. But I believe when I read it, it was about triple the fatality rate of, say, a 182. And a 172, obviously, you can you can almost land that thing, you know, <laughs> on, a, on a flat wall and, and walk away from those. But, um, but, but they have spent so much time educating people on how to use those parachutes that um, uh, those fatality rates are really now becoming quite in line with regular general aviation. Now, Amy, you're flying um, a lot now with the with the beginning pilots, um, where you know those those types of um, parachutes are becoming more popular. Is that part of the, your training? Do you guys have any um, planes uh, with your with your students that have those? Or you know, at the university where I teach, we we're a fleet of Piper. In fact, they bought 19 brand new airplanes from the factory in Florida and flew them up here over the last couple of years. Oh. So we're doing all archers and arrows and um, Seminoles for our training. Um, the university chose low wing because it the place where the university is in here in central Washington, our winds are often 30 or 40 knots plus oh, wow. um, a lot. <laughs> so I'd, I actually have never flown a plane with a parachute. Um, the gentleman that um, Dick was referring to, the vice president of Sarah, he's a really smart guy and, I think, you know, maybe he could be a guest for you on there because mm -hmm. it's a good question. And I'm sure he would have a lot of input for that, but I've, I've actually not flown with a parachute. We, we just do standard training, um, you know, and then in the backcountry stuff, most of the clients, most of my clients nowadays bring in things like Cessna 180s, 182s, 185s, uh, Super Cubs, Husky Scouts, you know, just kind of the normal sort of plane that people have. And, and again, it just depends. I keep saying that, but I guess it's worth repeating. It just depends on their mission. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, if you were to call me and say, Hey, I want to come fly with you. The first thing I would do is say, what's your objective. Mm -hmm. um, and some people tell me things that lead me to say, well, eh. I mean, I really just don't want to fly with them. It sounds kind of crass, but I, I have a limited amount of time. Mm -hmm. And if somebody has the attitude that I don't think I'm going to be able to help them because of that, then you know, maybe I'll spend my time, my time will be better spent with somebody who has the attitude that they want to learn and they want to, you know, progress and, and be able to make good decisions um, in, in any type of flying. So back to the question, though, I, I don't have any experience in parachutes. So we and our students at the university who are starting at the private pilot level all the way through CFI, it's it's basic type of training. You know, if you have an emergency, you deal with the emergency, you follow the procedures, you make good decisions and hopefully come out the other end in one piece. <laughs> mm, that's true. Now, I'll tell you, Bob, yeah, that my son um, likes having an, an ejection seat. And, <laughs> uh, and yeah, when people uh, are shooting at him. So, <laughs> so. He's doing, that's probably a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If people are shooting at the 182, I probably want the ejection seat in that too. So, <laughs> um, so what, what, we're, we're, we're getting a little bit close to the end of time. You know, one question I always like to ask is, you know, what is, and you may have already done it, right? So what is or has been, or would you like to be like your dream flight, right? So uh, you guys have so much beautiful flying, behind, you know, already. R you know, what was your, either your favorite flight or what is the one flight you'd still like to do? Well, I, uh, one of the other books I've written is Notes from the Cockpit. And it's basically about my flying career with um, short stories, a lot of them have a moral, a lot of them have a lesson. Um, but at the beginning of the book, I kind of describe my perfect day of flying. And it's uh, a beautiful day in a 185. And I'm going to five or six of my favorite little backcountry airstrips, you know, doing different missions as part of my part of my job, part of my, you know, from daylight to 11 a.m. or so. And um that still would be pretty much my doesn't get much better than that. I've I've flown in Alaska and I've I've flown 
pretty much all of the states and Mexico and Canada. And uh, I'm where I like to be and country I like. And that's, that. And you know, maybe if it was a Twin Otter instead of the 185, that'd be a little better. <laughs> that's That's it for me. Amy, how about you? Well, I've been having fun in the last couple of years because after flying to backcountry for a long time, I put my airplane on floats mm-hmm. on Amphibs, and that's a whole new adventure. But to answer your question most directly, I want to go to space. Okay. <laughs> I would love to get a fly in the – well, the space shuttle's not flying anymore. But the guys at SpaceX haven't gotten back to me. But um, you know. <laughs> I've got Elon Musk's number. Do you want me to? <laughs> you know, <laughs> do you want Elon me to put a uh, put a, a bug in his that's, ear? <laughs> that's been even though I like I said I grew up not even really thinking about flying. Um, I spent um, about ten years of my childhood near Orlando, Florida, between Orlando and the coast. We watched all the Apollo launches. Mm-hmm. I got to see the space shuttle. I know people who flew the space shuttle. There were mission commanders. And I just always had this thing of before I'm gone, I would love to go to space. That would be my dream flight. <laughs> uh, and just for those listening, nobody asked me for Elon Musk's phone number. I was actually kidding. I don't have <laughs> Elon Musk's phone number. <laughs> I'm going to get that one person like, I has Elon Musk's phone number. And I, I don't, I don't have, Elon Musk doesn't know who I am. So um, I have his Twitter, but so does, you know, 30 million other people. Um you know, I, I do think that we are in a, an age, I really think in the next 10, 15 years, maybe not even that long. I, you know, listen, I think you've got a shot uh, more than you think you might have. And, you know, um, I, I honestly, I think that they're going to be taking up people probably in the next three to five years. Um, that that uh, Starship that they've got, I think they can put 100 people in that thing. Um, it's, you know, I don't know. I want to see it land a bunch. Of, last time it tried landing, it blew up when it landed. So, uh, so, I, but all of his rockets blow up until they don't blow up anymore. And then they just seem to work really, really well. So, um, I'm super, super duper excited. I, I think you've got a chance at that. Um, we had George Bush senior skydived until when he was what? 90. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll give it a few years and then what have I got to lose when I'm pretty close to the end, right? I'll just get on the rocket. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, we need to have Richard Branson get his thing going because then uh, Elon Musk, he's a very competitive guy and Richard Branson's very competitive. And uh, so I think uh, when the two of them, I'd like to see, you know, um, Blue Origin get going, but you know, the, I don't know. We haven't seen it yet. But anyways, um, so I, I will say, Amy, you talk about mission. So if, if I if I come up and fly with you, you know, um, and Dick, I think you did this. So maybe you can tell me here what your, your love of you liked it, if it was good as you want. My dream flight is from Seattle to Anchorage. Um, that's that's my dream flight. That you know, follow along the Canadian coast and fly up and through, uh, see the mountains in Alaska. Um, to me, that's that's my dream. So I don't know if uh, backcountry flying. I think that would probably help, but it's probably a little different. But what do you think, Dick? You know, I, I did do that. I I have done that flight, and I was doing it IFR in a twin engine turboprop. Mm-hmm. So. We were in the clouds. You know, that route along the coast has a lot of bad weather. And I've I've wanted to do that a couple of times in the Cub, and it just hasn't been very feasible. But uh, this time when I was doing aerial firefighting for the government, uh, we had a twin-engine turboprop. We were in the clouds until we about um, just outside of Ketchikan. And then it was just severe clear, and it was an unforgettable flight. Uh, I, I burned about 150 pictures back, you know, still using film in a camera, but mm-hmm. through the, through the Wrangell, St. Elias and uh, the glacier fields and just, just incredible, incredible country up that way. Yeah. You would love it for sure. Yeah, I so badly want to see it. I I've done it in uh, the mic, the new Microsoft flight simulator that just came out and I'm sure it, <laughs> I'm sure it pales in comparison, but when I, when I do that flight on that, you know, um, thing, the simulator, I just think to myself how good it looks on a simulator on my computer screen. I can't even imagine what a life altering thing that must be to see it in real life. But well, you know, in our book, when it kind of a kind of an elective chapter on winter and ski flying, we feature uh, Paul Klaus and, and Mike Vivian. Um, and Paul Klaus has a lodge up in the, those mountains that you're talking about. And some of the photography, you know, ASA was originally going to make this a black and white, uh, picture book and Mm -hmm. after they saw what we had they turned it into color and um people have told us the book is worth it just for the 
color photographs from, especially from Alaska and the glaciers and that country up there. I agree. Yeah. I agree with those people. I mean, you just see some of the images and you just can put yourself into the seat of that airplane and it just makes you want to do it. I mean, <laughs> you, you know, you just can't even imagine it. Um, yeah. I got one last question for you. If you guys have an extra couple of minutes. Um, sure. So you, the air taxi. So, you know, like I said, a good portion of my audience are, are you know, people that are student pilots or people looking to get into flying. Um, but I do have some folks, um, I don't know, maybe 15, 20% of my folks um, are people that are already or have been in flying for a little bit of time. And, you know, they're looking for ways of building their hours, right? So the typical thing, and Amy, I'm sure you know this, right? So, you you know, you get your instrument commercial, your CFI, you teach some people for a year or two, right? You hope you get the 1500 hours and, you know, some folks want to move into the airlines. But there are a, a good number of people that seem like they find a different way, right? They uh, they don't do the CFI thing. They do the air taxi thing, right? Um, so from what you guys have seen for the air taxi, if, if somebody was, let's say, a relatively low hour, 300, 500 hour pilot, um, you know, is air taxi something nowadays you would recommend to somebody um, as they move through their aviation career? Well, of course, they under Part 135, they cannot hire them with less than 500 hours. Okay, so 500 is minimum. 500 is the minimum. Um, and then, of course, there's different you know, rules there. I mean, that's the way I started. I didn't even get my CFI. I had, I had over a thousand hours before I ever got my flight instructor certificate. Um, I got lucky because I learned to fly in salmon, Idaho. I'd flown a little airplane around the mountains. And so when I went to hire on, I knew they are taxi guys because they'd been flying me in and out of the river for so long. So I got hired with relatively low time uh, in that country. That being said, you know, if you want to go to Alaska, they want to see Alaska time. Mm-hmm. If you want to go to the Caribbean, you know, or if you want to fly floats like out in Washington, they want to see the type of time. So I encourage when you're talking to the exact audience that I have here at the university, these kids graduate with 250 or 300 hours. What do I do? I don't want to teach necessarily. Mm -hmm. Um, My advice is get out there, beat the bushes, um, put your resume in everywhere you can make make a personal appearance. Um, even at a lot of the companies, like there's a company in Spokane, Washington, other side of the state here that will hire them with 500 hours and put them in a Cessna caravan flying for their FedEx contract. Mm-hmm. And they just want somebody that's smart enough that, or, or at least dedicated enough that they want, they can train them. They'll train you themselves as one of their employees, but it really is a lot about the work ethic and your ability to apply yourself and commit, um, you know, to, your own flying into the company, et cetera. As far as backcountry air taxi, a lot of them, um, they want to see, you know, backcountry time, maybe more than actual time and type of aircraft, et cetera. I don't know. Dick, what do you think about that part of it? Yeah. Uh, I didn't build my time flight instructing either. I was actually a glider pilot in Sun Valley, Idaho. And, uh, the guy that hired me in the air taxi liked the fact that I had a lot of glider time couple hundred hours anyway um i what i would say about air tax it's different than it was when i was doing air taxi in the 70s um it's a lot harder to build time um it's a way to do it it was it was a good way for me um i think i would advise people to be careful uh which company they go with Mm -hmm. um it's not as highly regulated as 121 um, airline stuff. There are definitely fly-by-night outfits, um, outfits that are known for the best maintenance of their aircraft. Uh, I'd say, you know, go in with both eyes open and be aware and be a little bit careful, but it's an option. Okay, good. Yeah, I know that's really helpful to a lot of folks. And, you know, one of the things you mentioned in your book I've, I really liked is you know, um, you didn't say this exactly uh, word for word, but you, you mentioned, you know, uh, you know, I'm going to make it up you know, a thousand hours, say flying straight and level with autopilot on isn't the same, you know, quality of, of learning how to fly as say a hundred hours, you know, of really, you know, flying to precision, you know, in the back country. Um, you just, you know, you just learn a little bit more um, when you're really, really focused on it as opposed to letting the autopilot just go from point A to point B. Um well, I, I think that's all I had. Did you guys have anything that you wanted to bring up or anything else you wanted to mention? Uh, just thank you for inviting us. It's been very enjoyable getting to meet you. And um, 
the Civil Air Patrol is an, is an important entity. Um, uh, you guys do a good job, and um, we're, we're, I'm happy to be part of it this way. So, well, Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, Amy, anything uh, additional from you? Yeah, I, I echo that. And I, like I said, I've worked with Civil Air Patrol off and on for years, helping with, with training. I, th I think it's great that, you know, there's an organization like that that can help young people and also older people. Um, but it's uh, important to get people involved and, uh, you know, get them interested in something. That's the thing I think that I tell my students at the university. If you're passionate about something, it doesn't matter what it is. Mm -hmm whether it's flying or music or you want to go off and write books or, or whatever it is, if it's something that you're really passionate about, then go for it. Right. And then find people who are like-minded people who are mentors. Like I mentioned earlier, I, Dick was one of my mentors way back 30 years ago. Um, you know, and now here we are 30 years later having collaborated on this project, which turned out to be great. Mm -hmm. So those connections, and it brings it back to what you mentioned at the start of this whole uh, conversation was about connections because aviation is is big but it's also small right. and you, you, know, you put yourself out there you do the best you can you show that you have a great attitude and people are going to notice that and I'm speaking again to the younger people who um, you know I back in Clemson South Carolina when I was there there was a one of the students who was also on the football team wanted to be a professional pilot and he was flight instructing but he was also fueling airplanes and it turns out one of the companies that flew a jet in and out of there ended up hiring him as a pilot because he was always on time. He was professional. He fueled their airplane. Um, he was conscientious about it and they liked his ethic. And mm -hmm. so when it came time to hire a pilot, they came to him. So that's the key there. And then I'm sure your cadets are aware of that is just, you know, be honest, be the best you can be straight up. <laughs> and, uh, that's, you know, you can't fault that. Um, so good for them. I mean, go for it, go for what, what drives your passion. Yeah. And be present in aviation too. You know, we, um, we are one of our, one of my cadets up in Rochester, New York, before I came down to South Carolina, that's the exact story. He, um, he wanted to get in aviation. Um, I hope he's not embarrassed. Uh, I'm not gonna say his name, but he, he came from a family that didn't have a lot of money, right? Lovely family, incredible family. Um, you know, I mean, just incredible parents. But they just they just didn't have a lot of money and aviation is an expensive thing. So he got involved in Civil Air Patrol and then he did. He got a job at the Rochester International Airport on the line fueling airplanes when he turned 18. And he um, the he made friends with a couple of pilots and the citation is a single you know, a single pilot airplane. And so they ought, you know, one of the pilots said, Hey, I'm gonna move this airplane from point A to point B, and do you want to just come along? Right. And he was, Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, He's now a professional pilot because the company that was doing those air flights saw his passion for that work. Um, and they paid from zero hours all the way up to ATP. Um, wow. And that's how he got his job. And this is a kid who had literally like almost, he had, he had, he's one of the kids you see at the airport, right? At the line. And they've got a 35 year old car, you know, the, you know, the radio had stopped working 20 years ago. Um, and, and he's now a corporate, you know, airline pilot, um, because he showed that, that intense drive. So people that are out there, any cadets that are out there, um, I want, what I want you to hear from that is don't ever let somebody tell you, no, that you can't do this because you have a restriction for money or whatever. Um, you might have to find a different way of working to make those opportunities, but there's a lot of people with a lot of money. They're going to graduate flight school with a lot of debt who probably might never fly with that, with that, uh, with that gentleman's flying right now. So, um, so anyways, so that was really good. I appreciate that, Amy. I appreciate that, Dick. Um, with that, I think we're going to wrap it up now, Amy, quick question for you, just cause you said you talked with your, um, your airplane with the floats when Oshkosh gets back in session, um, have you ever flown into their little, uh, their little lake that they have there at Oshkosh with the floats yet? I have not, but I want to, it sounds like a blast. All right. <laughs> So I don't know what's going on with Oshkosh this year, but uh, next time you go to Oshkosh, let's touch base. Now, Dick, do you um, do you still go to Oshkosh at all, or you know, uh, I was pretty busy in my aviation career, especially that time of year. Mm -hmm. But uh, I did go once uh, three or four years ago. I, I loved it. It's a lot of people and it's humid, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, but it's an it's an incredible experience. 
Yeah, cool. So, so I guess Amy or, or Dick, if you guys ever get up to Oshkosh or Amy, especially if you bring up the airplane with the floats, uh, hit me up. I'd like to meet you guys out there sometime. Um, and uh, with that, I think we are going to wrap it up. Thank you so much to both of you um, for taking the time to speak with us today. I really do greatly appreciate it. And um, with that, I think we're done. So thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, it's a pleasure. All right. And that was our conversation with Amy Hoover and Dick Williams. Um, you know, long careers in aviation, really, you know, you can tell between both of them, not just the fact that they've been instructors and CFIs and, um, you know, you can help even hear from, you know, when Dick said the reason he started his school was he wanted to help safety, to help people. And you see that Amy um, is still in aviation, still teaching, um, still trying to help the next generation. And, um, and so you can see that their passion really shows. Um, again, their book, uh, I have read this um, you cover to cover. I'm really glad that we have this. We're going to put this up on, on our wall too at our squadron. Um, and it's uh, Mountain Canyon and Backcountry Flying. Uh, I'll put links to that down below. And I'll also put links to some of Dick's other books down there, as well as uh, Amy's website. Um, if you are looking for more information on what we're doing here, we have a couple places. All of our interviews, all of our guest hosts, we put them up on a podcast format so you can listen to all of them uh, while you're driving your car. And that's Aerospace Dash Live. So if you're on uh, iTunes or your favorite podcast, if you go to Aerospace Dash Live, you'll see this beautiful face pop up um, and you can click on that. And then uh, we do have Twitter. We don't have very many followers, um, but we do have Twitter out there. We try to um, let people know what's going on in aviation. That's at Aerospace underscore live. And then YouTube is kind of where if you're not inside of Civil Air Patrol, if you're outside of Civil Air Patrol, you don't have access to our videos inside of Civil Air Patrol. Um, YouTube is kind of where we're putting all of that. And so that you can find that at youtube.com slash Robert Roberts. Or if you just search on aerospace education, again, you'll see this beautiful face uh, will probably be the first uh, thing that you find when you search on that. Um, with that, if you want to learn more about Civil Air Patrol, you can visit gocivilairpatrol.com. Again, we have uh, cadets starting ages 12 um, years old, and we have a very aviation and aerospace education centric uh, model where we try to teach STEM through hands-on lessons. And so with that, I hope you all have a great day and we'll talk to you soon. Bye everyone. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed that video. If you did, please do me a favor, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button. If you want to see more content up here on the left-hand side, you're going to see another video from our, uh, this playlist. And if you click down here, you're going to see another video on our channel. Hope you guys all have a great day. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.